Hi, I'm Sam Hawley, coming to you from Gadigal Land. This is ABC News Daily. This week, the Indigenous Senator Lydia Thorpe quit the Greens and moved to the crossbench after voicing concerns about the proposed voice to Parliament. She's now declared herself a leader of the Black Sovereign Movement. Today, we unpack what Black Sovereignty is and its connection to the referendum later this year. And a warning, this episode contains the voices of Indigenous people who have died. I'm Hannah McGlade. I'm from the Kurin Manang people of West Australia, Associate Professor at Curtin Law School and a member of the UN Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues. So very well qualified to have this discussion with you. Yep. Mm-hmm. Hannah, you've spent more than 30 years as an Indigenous legal expert. I want you to tell me first the story about when you first learnt about the concept of Aboriginal sovereignty. Well, um, I learnt about Black sovereignty or Aboriginal sovereignty uh, when visiting the tent embassy in Canberra as a mm. law student, we were opposing at that time some new criminal laws uh, being introduced in West Australia uh, known as mandatory detention or three strikes laws, which were going to target Aboriginal what youth. Aboriginal parents around here? Aborigines say WA's tough legislation, the Crime Sentencing Bill, with prison terms of up to 18 years for serious and repeat juvenile offenders, is aimed at them, and many are scared. Highlighting that fear, four youths travelled from WA to Canberra for help. They've come here to the Aboriginal Tent Embassy seeking immunity, diplomatic immunity, because they're afraid of what's going to happen to them in Western Australia. Carmen Lawrence, this is your legislation, but this is what we think of it. So I was down the Tent Embassy and um, was welcomed there as part of a protest with young people from West Australia who came with me to highlight, um, you know, what was happening, what was being done uh, by our state. And they talked to me, the elders there, um, Kevin Gilbert, who's passed away, as well as um, Isabel Coe. We've been under a microscope for the last 210 years. And, you know, the Aboriginal Ten Embassy is a symbol of our fight. They talked to me about Aboriginal sovereignty and Kevin um, had actually developed some really great materials. I think they were even like in a cartoon form explaining um, sovereignty, a legal concept. In this day, concept. even after 20 years after the embassy, we still have Aboriginal children dying from lack of clean drinking water, the very basics of life, medication, adequate shelter. We still have not a secure land base in our own country. We have no economic voice. We have no political voice. We have only the Crown and the agents of the Crown imposed upon us. Uh, Kevin had studied uh, sovereignty and the way that Australia had been colonised by the British without respect to Aboriginal sovereignty. There has never been a legitimate deal done with us. Our sovereignty has never been recognised. Our lands have been invaded and held by terror and massacre. That's why we're here. What is Aboriginal sovereignty? What does it mean? From my perspective, it's um, really a reference to Aboriginal people's ongoing inherent rights as a sovereign people, people who haven't been Mm colonised, people who resisted the unlawful acquisition of Australia by the British. Because Aboriginal people's sovereignty was never respected or treated in accordance with the law of nations, as it was then known, it, it meant that Aboriginal sovereignty really has remained in existence. It has mm-hmm. it was never ceded uh, or given away through a treaty or agreement. That was how sovereignty or Indigenous relations were often negotiated by colonisers in the US. We know that. Mm. That didn't happen in Australia. Uh, and we know that there was no formal declaration of war that was another way in which uh, the colonisers uh, could defeat the peoples, the sovereignty of Indigenous peoples. So it's um it's a it's a political movement 
it is still a legal issue. I was going to say, if, if, if Aboriginal sovereignty was never ceded, as, as you said, what then does the law say about that? It says, the High Court of Australia has said very clearly in the Mabo decision some years ago now, Mm -hmm. that it simply won't look at the issue of Aboriginal sovereignty. Mm -hmm. For the first time, Australia has recognised the legal existence of Aborigines prior to white settlement. The case is a moral victory, as well as having great significance for land rights. But the court stipulates the ruling only covers the people of the Murray Islands, and anything else will be looked at on a case-by-case basis. While welcoming the ruling, the federal government says the practical implications may not be far-reaching. That any alarmist uh, speculation about uh, adverse consequences of the uh, decision ought to be uh, rejected. Uh, but nevertheless, it is of great symbolic importance to Aboriginal. It says, we, the, you know, the Europeans, we're sovereign and we're not going to question our own sovereignty. So that was the way they quickly dismissed it. There had been other cases before that. Similarly, the Australian courts said we're not going to look at Aboriginal sovereignty. So in Mabo was the, the last one. That's where na- native title mm. came about. But that wasn't... A yes to sovereignty is what you're saying. No, it it was a very clear cut. No, there is no chance that our the High Court will ever examine the issue of Aboriginal sovereignty. So it was, on the one hand, an incredible win, but at the same time, people, Aboriginal people, we saw what was said about sovereignty and the way that the High Court um, quickly sidestepped the issue. So that was disappointing, although not not surprising. Part of the reason, of course, we're talking about these concepts and trying to understand them in a deeper way is because of Lydia Thorpe and what she's had to say. It is also about uh, self-governance, self-determination and having the right to set up our own structures, which we've been able to do before colonisation, and the, the sovereign power to determine their own destiny. And that's all we're asking here. She's obviously come out and said the idea that the voice puts forward is a threat to Aboriginal sovereignty. And I just want you to explain what she would mean by that. It's hard to know um, what she means by that because Aboriginal people have been absolutely subjugated by the British colonial system and the laws. But, um, you know, to say actually that the voice proposed is a threat to sovereignty, you know, it's certainly not true. Um, uh, it's The voice is really about having a national Aboriginal representative body, a strong voice to advocate about issues affecting our people. So anyway, Lydia and perhaps a younger generation of um, Aboriginal people, they think that the constitution is, you know, it's a part of the white Western legal system and we don't want to be a part of that. I think that's what they're saying. We are the ultimate sovereign power here and this country needs to come to terms with that. If Labor is saying it doesn't cede it, then put it into the constitution, put it into the legislation. The First Peoples are the sovereign people of these lands. If it's no problem, then it's no problem. I would welcome it going into the... And I can understand that, but then there's the reality that actually, you know, we are here in Australia being subjected to, you know, mainstream laws and policies that are really harming and damaging many Aboriginal people in very um, shocking ways and... um, we have to have a strong voice on this and we want a, a national voice that isn't going to be constantly, you know, subject to the risk of a, a conservative government basically winding it up. Mm. That's what's been happening and that's what has to stop. So the news of the day is that the federal government is going to abolish the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. That should come, I guess, as a surprise to nobody. Prime Minister John Howard yes, said to today... Enter the, the system of elected government specifically for Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That's the core we of the We will introduce legislation to abolish ATSIC ATSIC itself will uh, be abolished with immediate effect. The voice clearly reflects uh, best practice in international human rights, in Indigenous human rights, 
Mm, okay, because Lydia Thorpe's concern, I suppose, is that, or she wants some sort of guarantee that the voice would not cede the sovereignty of Aboriginal people. Uh, well, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal legal experts, experts in Indigenous rights and constitutional law have made it very clear that this is a misguided thinking, that sovereignty is somehow affected by this, um, calling for the government to be explicit about this, I don't know, will they ever? I mean, we saw what the High Court did in the Mabo case. They sidestepped uh, um, the issue of sovereignty. You can certainly support uh, Aboriginal voice and support Aboriginal sovereignty at the same time. It's entirely consistent. And there's also a debate about what should happen first. So there's an argument that treaty should come first before the voice, whereas Anthony Albanese, of course, says the voice needs to happen first. Voice, truth and treaty. Let us have the voice to parliament constitutionally enshrined that First Nations people have asked for with a patience so great that it counts as an expression. We've never had a real chance to negotiate treaty A treaty has been a part of um, the National Aboriginal Rights Campaign. So now that we have the commitment from the uh, Prime Minister uh, to voice treaty and truth in this order, this is an amazing opportunity in history, I agree that voice has to come first. And we will need to negotiate a national treaty at the national level. Uh, And we have no national Indigenous body or voice. So it seems obvious as to why it would be the first necessary step to take. I just can't see how a national treaty would happen without the voice. Hannah, is there a risk that people will get lost in all of this in the lead up to the referendum, that voters will get confused by all of the arguments? Are you worried about how the debate is going at the moment? It has been worrying. People could could get a bit confused. Um, At the same time, there's a lot of support for voice from Aboriginal people. Polling has shown 80% of Aboriginal people support voice. Aboriginal people generally get it. Um, The campaign is really only just starting. There's a National Week of Action commencing on the 18th and uh, I I hope Australian people will um, see it for what it really is. Anna McLeod is a human rights lawyer and a member of the UN Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues. There's still no date for the voice referendum, although Anthony Albanese says it will be held later this year. This episode was produced by Flint Duxfield, Sydney Peed, Sam Dunn and Chris Dengate, who also did the mix. Our supervising producer is Stephen Smiley. Over the weekend, catch This Week with David Lipson. He'll be speaking about the housing crisis and rising interest rates. I'm Sam Hawley. ABC News Daily will be back again on Monday. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.